a real busy man. You know him from around town. He's he's got his finger on the pulse. And Ryan, I I just I I I we were trying to come in this morning after a loss, like you do regular season playoffs, whatever. And we we take the body, we put the chalk around it, we say, okay, this is that, that's there. Uh, we have our suits on and everything. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it is it is it is it physicality? Is it four posts? Is it goaltending? Is it lack of depth? Is it five on five? Where do you want to start, and where do you see this thing going as it stands right now, following last night? Where do I want to start? By the way, hey Jay, how you doing, buddy? Hi, good. How are you? Good, good, man. Great to chat with you. Doing a great job sitting in the big chair. Um, it is a big chair, I must say. It is, yeah, a large chair. <laughs> you've, got, you've got you've got great backup there with Eric. Um, okay, where do we want to start? Well, I mean, you should probably start with goaltending because it's probably the biggest question moving forward here. And you know, not only is it last night, but it's also what now. So I think let's start with goaltending, but I'm not going to say that goaltending is the reason that they lost the game last night. But I like night. it because it's yes. the crease and you're working your way out. Like, that's a nice... Well, yeah, let's work our way yeah, yeah. from the back out. So I think it's important, you know, Stuart Skinner didn't let any horrible goals in last night. And I think it's important to mention that. Like, when you're talking about goaltenders, you go goal by goal by goal and say, okay, reasonably, what could he have done? And there are no goals. I mean, there was no, you know, Jadorov beating him from way outside last... There was none of that last night. But also what there wasn't was any spectacular saves taking away those prime scoring chances. Like bottom line, you know, Arthur Shilovs is is stopping a lot of the order's best scoring chances. You know, a lot of them. And that's what you need to get in the playoffs. Stuart Skinner um, is having a hard time coming up with the big, big save. And you can say, well, that's not fair. Guys should just have to be steady and other mistakes and give away right. But to win in the playoffs, your goalie needs to be capable of making big, big saves. It's just what's required. And, you know, I didn't love the third one. He's down, feels like he's down early, feels like he's deep in his net. He's getting beat to the side. You know, Besser's a good shooter. We know that. Um, but he's getting outplayed. And his overall body of work in the playoffs is, I mean, the numbers are an atrocity. Like, the numbers are just awful. That doesn't. That's not necessarily fair because you need to, you know, you need to zoom in a little bit. But bottom line, he's getting out goaltended by a guy that has an excellent experience. And you just have to wonder where his head is at. And so the Oilers have a decision to make. I think there's a very good possibility that Calvin Pickard will start game four. Um, and I would start Calvin Pickard in game four. When Skinner's game started going the wrong way in the second round last year, he couldn't get it back. He couldn't get it back. And they refused uh, to go to the other guy, right? No matter how well Campbell was playing in relief, they kept going to Skinner, kept going to Skinner. And I think if you look at that history and if if you look at what happened, um, I think you need to give the other guy a go here. And and Pickard's proven, albeit in a backup role during the season, um, that he can come in and do a job, provided he sure. hasn't played a playoff game here or anything such as that, but well-liked. And I think Jay mentioned as well that you're kind of, that too lights a fire under the team and says, you know, Look where Skinner is now, and you guys. And now let's work our way outside of the crease. And, and talking about this team as a whole, and we've been saying too the physicality and just the punch back and the bite. And and I just want to get your thoughts on the kind of the melee happening post game yesterday. It's funny that Shilovs makes another brilliant save as the time just hits zero. Yeah. And I thought that was pretty indicative of kind of how the night goes. He doesn't even make a save in that moment, does it? Um, but the Susie's a door of pinball machine that they put McDavid through. Now I know guys rush to the defense and everything happens afterwards. But just the Zadora, Zadora putting Kane into the bench, all of those things, like you do feel like this team's getting a bit, is ragdoll the proper term here, Ryan? I don't know if that's too strong of a word, but. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I think that's, I think that's too strong a word, um, but I totally take your point. Um, I mean, the Zadorov thing, that just is what it is, right? Um, I think the refs did a terrible job there. Like, don't give a penalty to anybody there. Just let that happen. Sure. It's a funny play. It happens. It let everybody get on with their business. Everyone was fine. Uh, that was a little bit goofy there. What I didn't like, and Strud's made this point, you know, when I asked Strud's last night, what do you think? The first thing he talked about was how the orders didn't meet the moment early in the game and exactly what you're talking about, right? Matias Ekholm gets dummied twice in the first shift there. And it was like, okay, the Canucks have showed up to play. The Canucks have brought their physical game and they've showed up to play. Now, what do we? What do you see from the owners as a result of that? And the point that Strud's made, and I completely agree with him, is just it just there wasn't enough pushback. The owners didn't show up with that game and push back and and show up willing to play that type of game. So you know, fast forward to the end of the game, what happened there? 
Uh, yeah, uh, McDavid didn't like getting shoved. He throws a two-handed slash to the pad. Um, you know, Susie slashes him back. Then there's a, a door off cross check, which I thought was pretty vicious, like right to the low back, right? You're trying to hurt a guy when you hit him there. Um, it happens all series long though, right? I mean, the orders have been doing similar things in play, throwing cross checks around and stuff. That is what it is. But the combination of that and then one to the teeth was, or the head was not a great look. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen from this thing. I mean, if they came out and said, look, a cross check to the face, it's just not going to be acceptable. And, and he gets a game. I wouldn't be surprised by that, but I also will not be surprised one bit if it's only a fine. Um, he popped right I mean, back Sam, up. Doesn't look like he's hurt too much, right? Like, well, and, and credit to McDavid. Like yeah. that all that sequence looked like it hurt, and he was not staying down. Um, you know, in any way, shape, or form. But I mean, we saw Sam Bennett absolutely dummy Brad Marchand, like just dummied him with a sucker, and and he's skating around out there playing and scoring goals, right? So the Department of Player Safety, who the hell knows? Oh, exactly. Quite frankly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I would say the, you know, response in the moment, a few guys tried to get in there. I think Hyman jumped in there right away, whatever the game was over. That is what it is. But I would say bigger picture, the Edmonton Oilers have far too many players skating around out there thinking it's not their responsibility to try and be physical and, um, and take part in that part of the game. They have far too many players who just think either someone else will do it or I don't have to. Um, I'm not sure if this is the way the head coach wants him to play because I've asked Chris Knobloch about the physicality of this team and he brushes it off like it's not a big deal. I think that's a mistake. If that's the message they're getting in the locker room, I don't think that's the right way to coach in the playoffs. I don't know what they're being told. All I know is that Ryan McLeod has gone four of his last five games without throwing a single hit. Yeah. He had one game where he had three and he's had zeros across the board. Um, you know, Cody Cece. Never throws hits. Darnell Nurse had one hit over a four-game stretch, and we finally started asking about it. Like, this team doesn't seem to understand that it's everybody's responsibility to get the level of play up to playoff intensity. And you playoff intensity, you guys, you take care of all the details. You go out there and you leave nothing to chance. So that means skating hard, finishing checks. That's the basics you can control. It's one of the easiest things to do to finish checks. And no, you don't want guys running out of position and running all over the place being yeah. dumb about it, but you definitely finish the obvious ones. You have to try to get through an entire NHL playoff game with zero hits. You have to be making an effort not to hit anybody out there. A conscious effort every shift. I just don't want to do it. And the orders have way too many guys who think it is not their job. And as a result, they are not at the intensity level required to win in the playoffs. And yes, it's not the reason they lost, right? They hit a pile of goal posts. The other goalie played great. Yeah. But if you want to evaluate overall the Oilers' level of play and any prayer they have past this round, it ain't even close intensity-wise. So they might have got away with that against L.A., they're not getting away with it against Vancouver here, but they will get dummied in the next rounds if these players don't figure out this is the minimum level required of effort and intensity tonight. And that involves getting a little bit dirty. And I, I couldn't agree more with you, Shoggy, on that because, you know, we've been talking about it all morning. Just this isn't a this is an effort issue where you're making the conscious decision to be more physical. And the Oilers simply haven't brought that at this point. Now, leading in or, or answering that and saying, OK, there needs to be some sort of a change here. Uh you know, obviously the, the Oilers' success depends on their top six players, but that bottom six has been lackluster, unemotional, and, and really, you know, like you said, almost going out of their way not to be physical. Do you see any, you know, bottom six changes? Obviously, Pickard, you know, you, you've stated that you feel that he's going to start in game four. Do you see any changes happening in this bottom six lineup? Well, I tell you who I would like in the lineup is Sam Gagne and Sam Carrick. But here's the problem. You can't slow yourself down that much. Yeah. And, and that's an issue. And I mean, no disrespect to these players, but I think we know what their strengths are, right? So to inject both of those guys into this series right now, I, I would worry about your overall level of speed out there. I, I, I really would. So you probably got to pick one or the other, I would think. Um, let's see what happens with Adam Henrique, whether he's available or not for the next game. If he is, there's a change for you right away. Um 
but I think Carrick is probably the obvious one. Uh, he's a guy that will finish checks. He will. He's a guy that will stand there in front of Nikita Zadorov and challenge him to a fight. He's a guy that will, you know, not that that's going to swing the series or matter, but my point is, is you know he's going to engage. You know he's going to be in the fight. And right now the Oilers have a lack of players who are actually going out of their way to make sure they're in the fight. You got a lot of guys that are tiptoeing around the edges of the fight and they're not really truly in it. You've got Corey Perry out there. I mean, like his movement is is limited out there, his mobility, right? Yeah. After the whistle, he's stopping in the crease. He's trying to get into the goalie's grill to shake him a little bit. He's trying to engage with the fence, but he's trying to go do Corey Perry things out there. He's got two or three guys on him in the crease, and he's got his line mates skating around, like looking up at the scoreboard to like just look away, just look away, right? Ryan McLeod's just like floating around. Corey Perry's in there just trying anything. It's just not good enough. It's not intense enough. It's just not. So, yeah, you want to see Sam Carrick in there. You know Gagne would be in the fight. Gagne would inject a little bit more skill into that bottom six, which I think you need. I just don't think you can make both those changes. As tough as as much as you might want to see both those guys, because Gagne has this way of finding moments, I just don't think you can make both of those. So it's one or the other. We're, 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 we're dicing up the Oilers' effort, but people are loving yours this morning, Ryan, in the nasty chat. Uh, Ryan Rashog looks pissed, LMAO. Uh, fired up Rashog is the Rashog I, I don't enjoy. Care. No, no, you, you care. And it's it's not, somebody said not mad, just disappointed. Uh, and then 97 I'm not Octane, disappointed. I don't care. I don't cheer. 97 Octane <laughs> says, Shogger for Jack Adams. So you can tuck that in your pocket yeah. and uh, put that All on right. a cover letter moving forward. Uh, but I want to get your thoughts. You mentioned a name in there as well. And as we work our way out from, from the crease, um, you went with Pickard. You mentioned Carrick and Gagne. Um, I yep. wanted to get your thoughts, and if you could just elaborate, if you can, if you have the info. The Adam Henry question, um, to which when he was acquired, I know it's not a flashy name, and a lot of people, oh, hole in this, all that. Yeah, but the guy, Ken, provides you with some flexibility. Um, had the goal in the open. Like, seemed like he was kind of fitting in and finding a place for himself, and I just wanted your thoughts on the importance um, or and if when we can expect to see him back, if at any time soon. But given that flexibility, and not just to say that the Oilers miss him, the individual, but what, would, what did he bring to kind of that top six in order of just having guys where they maybe should be, and now with him out of there, you're you're moving to fill these spaces. Like Fogel's yeah. game yesterday, unfortunately, for the season he had, um, was just putrid. So I know we've done the goaltending, we've gone to the bottom six. What are you looking at, if anything? Are you, are you keeping 29-97? Are you moving that around? And the yep. Henrique question as well just kind of throws a... Okay, so we'll start with Henrique. Um, he's hurt. And when Adam Henrique is hurt and it's a lower body injury and it affects his skating, you can't play him, right? They it's tried not a toughness to play him. issue. It's not a toughness issue, right? No, no, no. They yeah. tried to play him and it was a huge mistake, Yeah. right? He should not have played in that game. It was very clear he wasn't up to speed. Made a mistake on the penalty kill that if he's up to full speed, he does not make. Um, so if you notice his, his minutes there, uh, you know, they played him probably with penalty killing in mind through yeah. the injury. And you know, I think that was all the penalty killing he did for the entire night. He did his best, but clearly he's banged up and, uh, they made a mistake. And so he comes out for the following game. Now I'm not putting him back in anywhere near the top three lines unless he is yeah. much, much yeah. better. If you want to put him in, in a fourth line role, um, in limited minutes, if he's still hurt, then fine. He's a good player to have in there. Um, that'll be frustrating for Oilers fans. They look at Carrick, who hasn't been in. They look at Henrique, who hasn't been contributing. He's been hurt, and they see that first-round pick. That's easy to throw a pile of criticism at them. Uh, if Adam Henrique is healthy, he's helping out. He's definitely helping this team out. Um, a healthy Adam Henrique would be, uh, but unfortunately for him and them, uh, he's just not. So what are you left with in the top six? What do you do? Well, um, Rob Brown made this point last night and we've been hard on the bottom six and I think it's fair, but I also think it's fair to say they've been doing a lot of sitting on the bench, watching other people play. Yeah. Like they have been rolling McDavid and Dreisaitl out there an ungodly number of minutes the last couple of games. And part of the problem and Jay Woodcroft found this is when you engage them to that degree, you disengage everybody else. And so now you've got fourth line players who would be saying, that's fine. Great. Sure. Criticize me. I'm getting six minutes. What do you want from me in six minutes? And there is a fair point to be made along those lines. So I think that Chris Knobloch probably needed to be figuring out a way to, to keep those players engaged. Um, and I think he knows this formula is not going to get them anywhere in the postseason playing these guys 30 minutes a night. So it's time, if Dreisaitl can handle it, it's time to separate those two. Get McDavid and Dreisaitl back on separate lines. 
I think he would have to consider going 93, 97, 18 again. It's the best line they had all season long, not even close to being the best line that they had all season long. It was by a mile. And then you look at Evander Kane with Dylan Holloway and uh, Leon Dreisaitl would be my thought on that second line. Uh, you give Warren Fogle another chance here uh, because you know he's going to want to earn that back. But in a third-line role, uh, Ryan McLeod in the middle, and then I think Corey Perry over on the right side is fine. If you want to pull Perry out and put Gagne in instead, veteran skill, I could maybe understand that. Yeah. But I'm not sure. This is kind of what you have Corey Perry for. Yeah. So I'm not sold on that change. And then Carrick in the middle on the fourth line. Uh, Matthias Janmark, I thought, actually played not bad, played pretty well, and I would have liked to have seen some more minutes for him. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, so it, now it's about Brown. You got you got some decisions to make. I think 39 and 89 at the same time is not the right call. So, how, how does but he I avoid think, that I temptation, though, in. to not go to that well, right? Like, it's kind of a chicken and the egg. You can't produce if you're not getting any minutes, but he's not giving you any minutes because he – seems to think rather right or wrong that this is going to give him the best chance to win. Yeah, so I think I think players need to do a better job of of, of giving the coach no choice, right? That's the thing. I, I believe that if somebody went out there and was like finishing checks and creating and all that, I mean, I think the coach would love it. Okay, great. Sure. Keep putting that guy out too, right? Yeah. But I do think he missed some opportunities, right? Jan, Mark, and Ryan had some really good shifts and some really good looks. They played next to no minutes in that game. Uh, basically played them out of the game because, frankly, he continued to play guys that should have been benched. Uh, so I think that just reading – and I think Chris Knobloch's really good on that bench for the most part and does a good job with these things, but um, I would have liked to have seen more Yanmark and less Fogel last night. right? I would have liked to have seen some guys that were showing up to have gotten elevated minutes, maybe juggle the lines around, put more of a focus on them. And guys who aren't in the fight, sit them down. Sit them down. Doesn't matter what they've done all year for you. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Sit them down if they're not in the fight. That, you, that's the yeah. minimum requirement in the playoffs. If you're not in the fight, you don't get to play. As I tell you what, the other head coach did that. And the other head coach made some lineup changes and brought some guys in. And those guys were gamers. Yeah. So that's what's required right now. Feelings be damned. I agree with you there. And I just want to finish up. We've worked our way out brilliantly here, Lear. We're painting a nice picture. Let's get to the coaching. Let's get to the benches. You just had your thoughts on Knobloch. Um, I think tockett has been doing a great job man-to-man -man with his with his bench and his roster, albeit watching him closer, closer in this series. Uh, but your thoughts on the coaching balance here between the two teams and, and, and how you see this kind of evolving as we make our way through the series as well. Yeah, I mean, I understand why Knobloch has done what he's done. You're down one nothing in Vancouver. You have to win that game. So if you're losing that game, you're losing with a pile of Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid on the ice. I get it. I mean, we've seen every other Oiler coach over the last seven, eight years have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you do also need to recognize, and he does, because he said it after the game, that's not the formula to get anywhere. It's just not. So... He needs to figure out how to get more from his bench. He needs to figure out how to get more from more players. And that is a combination of him making a conscious effort to keep more guys engaged. Um, but I think it also has to do with sending the message crystal clear that if you didn't show up to play tonight, um, there's going to be a price to be paid for that. And, you know, outside of 29, 97, 18, um, you know, it, it really, it, it, that has to apply to everybody. Like, I think it even strength Nugent Hopkins has a lot more to give too. Yeah. Um, so I think for Chris Knobloch, he's got to keep more guys engaged, but he's got to pick and choose the right guys to keep engaged. He's got to back off the minutes of the big guys. And I think he's got to separate them. Easy, easy job to do. I mean, that sounds very simple <laughs> to kind of walk that line and, and determine all that. Um, Ryan, I just, I want to thank you for your time again. I did see a young individual drafted last week in the WHL draft. Uh, any yeah. connection there? Do you want to kind of take a, a few seconds, please? Yes. Yeah, yeah. My nephew Sam, who plays out of Calgary, was uh, drafted by uh, Vancouver, which okay. is very cool. So that's my brother Rob, his son Sam. And the first one in our family to uh, to be drafted in the Bantam draft. So exceptional yeah, congratulations status. to him. It was pretty cool. Except yeah. Exceptional. <laughs> uh, he's an exceptionally amazing young kid. How's that? <laughs> Great nephew. Hey, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, awesome nephew. Really appreciate your time. And what do you got coming down the pipe as well for listeners and viewers as well? We're going to catch your uh, the Yeah, we're just shit. Yeah. So we dropped one last night. Great post game pod last night. Brownie was on fire. Struds was awesome last night. So definitely encourage you to check that out. Uh, and then we're just in the chat right now. Figure out if we should drop one tonight. So Do I it. think we're leaning towards doing Do it, it, but Do keep it. an eye on our socials 
and uh, we'll get another podcast out there tonight because we like I'll be down at the rink today. We'll figure out what's going on. We'll see what the head coach says about the goaltending. We'll see. By the way, guys, very very unusual. Stuart Skinner is probably the most accountable player I have ever covered. Like the guy's unreal. He comes out and he stands there and he answers your questions and he doesn't get combative and he owns his mistakes. Um, he's been amazing. Last night decided not to come out. And that is so unlike him. That is so unlike him. And the rules are you have to come out. Like there's no choice in the matter. Like when you get to the third or fourth round of the playoffs, the NHL steps in, there's no ducking the media, right? Yeah. And so players need to get used to on a big stage if things go bad and you got to come, that's just part of the job, right? So, you know, there shouldn't be a choice, but he didn't come out last night. And and why I mention it is because it's so out of character for him. Huh. So you think about how high the pressure is right now for Stuart Skinner to not come out and do his media is, is so out of character for him. And I just thought it was notable that he didn't because it's, it, he just never does that. That's something to keep in. And that's, that's that, those are those details, man, and that's why we. Pay I'm sure he'll talk today. Pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I'm sure he'll talk today. But we were looking at each other, going, "What? Like what? He always comes out, right? Always." Uh, but the pressure is high, man. The pressure is high right now, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see the the choices the Oilers make and the way some of these players respond. Shoggy, just a quick one in closing. Uh, do you yeah. think? Do you think the Oilers keep this decision on goal on the goalie? You, they, they keep that close to the vest or do you, do you think you'll have something, you know, firm today? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, Jay. And I'm not sure we're learning about this head coach as we go. He's been the most transparent of all the older head coaches about his lineup. He doesn't worry. He doesn't try and play head games. He's not trying to play chess with us thinking we're all playing checkers. Um, he generally just says what he can say. Uh, with that said, they're not skating. It's going to be a team meeting. Uh, I have a feeling they're going to say we're still looking at it. And then we'll find out at the morning skate tomorrow, and then the starting goalie will talk. Um, but I think we'll speak to Skinner today. Chris will probably not give us a firm answer today, and we'll wait till tomorrow would be my thought. Ryan, we'll let you uh, get back to the beat here. Appreciate your time, man, as always. <laughs> and, and good luck. Keep doing what you're doing, and, and we'll talk next week. Thanks, guys. Great to chat with you. Have a great show. There you have it. Ryan Rashog from the Got Your Back podcast, as well, TSN, your Edmonton-based reporter, all things Edmonton Oilers, and he joins us, as usual, on Monday mornings. We appreciate his time.